change is already acting to exacerbate violence in the form of religious, ethnic, political violence by, and is doing this by interacting and exacerbating the pre-existing crises of neoliberal, which is to say radical free market economic restructuring, which has been pushed by the core capitalist economies upon much of the global south over the last 30 years. And that legacy is, has led to um, increased inequality, which I didn't actually mention earlier, and uh, reduced state capacity to respond to climate change. And then the other legacy is Cold War militarism, which has littered the global south with cheap weapons and men who know how to use them. And so when people face the economic dislocations associated, uh, caused by the extreme weather associated with climate change, they can't, toward, can't turn towards any kind of social programs from the state in many parts of the global south because the state has, in the name of economic efficiency, been reduced to a mere shadow of itself. So how do they adapt? In many places, it's by picking up the gun and um, engaging in sort of conflict systems and economies of conflict. And that in, the, in response to all of this, in the global north, where there isn't a direct kind of causality of violence by climate change, there is a growing consciousness among military planners that the world is entering a dangerous and destabilized place, and their preparations for that are for an open-ended sort of global scale counterinsurgency, which I think is very dangerous and very bad because it precludes more progressive uh, ways of mitigating and adapting, which we really need to start dealing with. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, what I tried to do was uh, uh, to try to resituate climate change in what can be called uh, the historical, political, social, and economic context. I mean, it's not something which is happening in some abstract place somewhere. It is a particular context in which it is happening with a particular history, particular way of doing things, um, you know, a nature of political interaction, et cetera. So try to resituate and try to sort of, you know, draw some, some of the links between them. Uh, if I could say one thing which I didn't quite say in the morning, but it was implied, is that paradoxically, uh, if you have tried to understand or address the problems of developing countries, you may be much better situated to understand and address the problem of climate change. In the sense that, you know, this kind of a large systemic problem is something that many developing countries have tried to address, uh, whereas, you know, it, you look at the modernization process in what are now called the rich countries, I mean, you know, there's a sense in which it happened and then after the fact, <coughs> we started looking at it while we were always dealing with little uh, problems on the side, as it were. So this thing about a broader social problematic um, is, you know, perhaps it's, it's much, people who study developing countries are much more comfortable with this. Um, so that, that was one of the implications. The third point, uh, also is that um, that to look at a problem in ways which are conducive to open or tacit conflict is a recipe for not solving the problem. So ways of looking at the problem that enable or facilitate mechanisms of cooperation are much better situated to do that. I tried to give an example also in, T tangentially about developing countries that people who have tried to address development as a cooperative approach have oftentimes been more successful than those who didn't. Um, and finally, what I tried to say in, in this context was that there are ways we know enough, both in terms of technology, politics, and economics, to begin to address this, you know, through ways in which we can sort of rejuvenate or, or, or incentivize the renewable energy sector to actually become and take over the, uh, the, the um, uh, the field. And so focusing on that instead of how to divide up the climate space, it seems to me is the better approach to go. So that's, those are the, the, the four major points. Okay, I, uh, I was worrying about the uh, relationship between uh, climate change and uh, justice in particular and um, the kind of violence that we often call injustice, which 
uh, peace scholars call structural and cultural violence. And um, asked the question uh, and interrogated briefly uh, the ways in which uh, climate change diminish, uh, damage, uh, and threaten human lives and non-human lives as well, other biota and other animals. And uh, claimed, I, I think it's a straightforward claim, that if people's lives are damaged and diminished and threatened uh, by uh, climate change, then climate change uh, presents a problem for justice. We have reasons of justice and reasons of peace to mitigate uh, climate change as best we can. And uh, I introduced a, a particular way of thinking about justice uh, because I think it helps us do so particularly well in regard to this problematic. And borrowing from Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum and others, I uh, summarized the human uh, development and uh, capabilities approach which is a way of understanding justice, which is compatible with uh, ideas about human rights and ideas about primary goods, ideas about welfare and resources, but is uh, in some ways, uh, I think, far more rich than those other accounts of justice because they focus on not what people have in a narrow quantitative sense, but this uh, approach to justice, which I um, suggested is valuable, uh, thinks uh, hard about what people have the opportunity to become and have the proper opportunity to become, what kind of capabilities uh, should they have the ability to nurture or have nurtured uh, to uh, develop or have developed, uh, what kind of uh, um, actual aspects of well-being are made available in their lives. And if we think about justice in that way, and we think about peace in that way, then I think it helps us see how immediately and how profoundly climate change is a threat to um, justice, a threat to peace, precisely because it is very much a threat to human well-being in many different respects in regard to peoples around the planet. And uh, so I also talked a little bit about how this is true for other biota, other animals and species. But I, of course, well, I did, in fact, spend most of my time, however, talking about human beings and in particular. So thank you. And um, I tried to um, kind of rewind the tape and look at the early 90s in the aftermath of the Cold War. And the environmental left and uh, observers basically began during that, at that time period, and they did so in the 80s to a certain extent as well. I mean, the um, Sustainable Development Report out of the UN did this as well. But in the early 90s in particular, the environmental left toyed with the idea or suggested that, you know, environment be treated as a security concern. Um, that, you know, by securitizing it, by raising it as a national security issue, it would get the attention it deserves from policymakers. And um, I didn't talk about this this morning, but, um, Senator Gore at the time, you know, in Earth in the Balance before he became Vice President Gore, um, he, he, argued, he argued in this fashion. Um, not that he's, you know, on the hard left, but, you know, he's certainly left of center. Um, what happened in the early part of the last decade, in 2001, 2002, 2003, is that the environmental left got its wishes um, and that the Pentagon and security establishment and intelligence agencies um, did increasingly look at climate change as a security issue. Um, so this is what Christian was speaking to in his presentation this afternoon and just now. Um, and they began to ca cast, in particular, climate refugees as the human face of climate change. Uh, they didn't put it in human face terms, but they began to cast climate refugees as a security threat um, in 2000, uh, 2003, 2004, and so on. I tried to argue that this has uh, several implications. One is that it scapegoats people who aren't uh, responsible for climate change in the first place. Second one is that it leads to a, a militarization of borders, again, as Christian spoke about in his presentation. Um, third one is that it leads to support for authoritarian transit states, states that are on the border of advanced industrialized groupings like the EU or, or North America, the United States. Um, so I think there's some deep implications of this kind of discursive turn and, and, and policy turn um, on the part of the security establishment. 
I also tried to argue that it, the irony is that climate-induced migration, that climate refugees, is not as profound a concern as it's um, as the as the as the the more fearful images uh, suggest. The, the, the images of hordes or massive flows of refugees moving toward uh, uh, advanced industrialized borders, that it's overstated, that definitely climate change has affected people and will continue to affect people in profound ways, but that oftentimes migration studies show us that people do not move large distances, cannot move large distances in the face of gradual onset environmental change and certainly can't move long, long distances um, in, the, in the face of sharp cataclysmic events as well. So I think some irony to this kind of take that the security establishment um, has embraced um, and that as well the, uh, the, the environmental left has done as well. My deepest concern, and just by way of conclusion, my deepest concern is that this kind of discursive turn and this kind of policy turn on the part of the security establishment is what Peter Andreas at Brown University calls politically successful policy failures. Um, they work, it appeals to people, it's it kind of, it's much like the border does uh, between the United States and Mexico. It, it, it's, a, it's electorally appealing to people, it's electorally appealing to politicians to play this card, um, but as a policy, it's a, it's a failure, it doesn't work. And so that's what I um, was trying to get at in my presentation this morning. So I'll stop there. Okay, so now what the idea, the idea here is that you would just ask us questions, and you could ask any one of us or all of us or any grouping of us, and uh, we'll answer them. And, uh, we, we might ask questions of each other too, but we, after, after each of us giving a, a lengthy presentation and you know, having a day of, of dialogue and uh, information, we, we hope that you will have some thoughts about this matter. And, uh, and even if you weren't here for most of the day, uh, you might have walked into the room with some thoughts. And uh, it's the success of this next hour is um, very much dependent on you. So I'm uh, putting you all on the spot, and I want you all to ask uh, good questions. And uh, so who's going to be courageous and start? Luis? I guess I'll start. OK. So um, tell, tell us who, who you're directing your question to. And maybe we'll, one microphone will go out there. Because we want your voice to be recorded also. Sounds good. OK. Here's my, my radio voice. Thank you. Uh, make sure to turn it on. Um, OK. So this question goes for uh, Mr. Banuri. I hope that said that right. Um, so Mr. Banuri, I, I know that you have experience working with uh, IGOs, such as uh, the United Nations, right, and working on these matters. Now, we know that, the, the, that we know that climate change is an issue. We know it's happening. Um, we know that um, the current way that we live in is not good enough and that there's changes that need to be made. However, the question is that um, how capable are IGOs, international uh, inter intergovernmental uh, organizations, uh, that are mostly represented, like the United Nations, I'm, I'm, I'm targeting exactly to the United Nations, uh, how, how, how possible is it for organizations whose interests are being, rep whose national interest, how, how will it be possible for IGOs, which are composed of, of, of a, a group of nations, which represent that group of nations and the interests of those group of nations, essentially the elite of those countries, to handle such transnational issues um, when, um, when in reality, when you look at Rio, for example, uh, you have the, the conversations that are happening in Rio and more, more recently in Doha. Um, you have countries that are the leads of those countries, the presidents, you know, the ministers that are representing the interests essentially of, of big corporations and whatnot. Um, and, and there's all these NGOs that are swept aside. There's also the fact that the majority of humanity is young people, and young people don't get a voice, especially when we talk about Africa, where uh, the political culture doesn't even uh, allow young people to get involved that much in politics. So already half of the world is not even, their voice is not represented in this matter. Uh, and somehow we have this hope that, that the United Nations or, or some IGO will be able to provide those transnational solutions, those transnational agreements to, 
to, to, shape, to, to change our, our, our direction. So if you have some words about that, whether you have hope on that, whether you don't, whether you feel like there has to be some reform and whether that reform would have to include NGOs and also somehow the youth and, and, and if any, anyone else wants to add something else in the panel as well, you can do that. So. I think that's a recipe for inviting me again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lewis, for, for, for that question. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very sophisticated question, and there, there's lots to be said about it. Um, I, will, I will raise two or three points just to give a, um, sort of a flavor. Uh, one is just a technical one. I mean, you know, in the international world, IGO is a, a phrase which is used for international NGOs. Uh, the ones that you're refer referring to, international organizations, you know, you, either UN system or international organizations is better used. Just, just a usage kind of a term. It's not, it's not very important. Um, <clears throat> um, here's the thing. First of all, I think uh, just try to, uh, you know, just to try to explain what the international system is. Um, there's a very nice statement attributed to Herbert Crowley, who was the, um, uh, the, the founder and the first editor of the New Republic, in which he described the American system. I'm actually being a little bit unjust to him, but uh, I'm, I'm twisting his words a little bit, but uh, you, you won't notice, and, and he's not around to notice anymore. Um, he said the American system is a, a Hamiltonian system in pursuit of Jeffersonian ideals. Okay, and you being a philosopher would probably appreciate it. The, when, the, when this country was founded, Hamilton wanted a strong state and a treasury and a military and the Federation should be able to do things. Jefferson wanted a completely decentralized state. The states would be the ones which would be the actors. The federal government would be pretty much just an association which would meet and maybe discuss things and give some normative guidance, etc. but it would basically be run by the states. Um, the reason I say that is that the international system that we have constructed today is exactly the opposite. It's a Jeffersonian system in pursuit of Hamiltonian ideals. Okay, and by a Jeffersonian system, think about it, there is a legislature, but the executive is, is in the countries. There's no executive. Or, or to the extent that the executive is there, it is in the, in the, in the, in the different countries. So it is as if Washington passed an environmental law and then basically gave it to the states and the states said, okay, we'll think about it or we'll do something or whatever. And the states assembled once in a while and just sort of talked about what they were doing. Do, do, do you see? I mean, that's the, that's the system we've set up. Now, the reason for setting up that system are also quite clear because, you know, we don't necessarily want to precipitate a new war in order to address some new problems, but we also want to wa find ways to, to move ahead. So when you think of the United Nations system, the United Nations system, you have to think in terms of a legislative process which is trying to clarify what our common ideals are, what the common frameworks for addressing those problems are, and in certain areas where we have agreed to do things and how to proceed about that, but not everywhere. In most of the cases, it's just setting out what the common ideals are. So when you look at the climate process, for instance, a lot of time has just been spent to describe what, are, what is it that we are after. You know, how do we frame that, that, that entire question? A little part of it, which is now sort of almost the rubber hitting the road, is really about how to operationalize it. And that operationalization has taken, has and will continue to take place through the political powers that exist already, right? Um, another one other metaphor, if I can give you, is that when you think of the, con the world as a, as a whole, think about it as if it's a single country, okay? Seven plus billion people, per capita income of about nine, ten thousand um, dollars. And think about it, what does, what, is, what does this country look like? If, if you think about it, you'll realize that it's a developing country. You know, large parts are poor, some parts are rich. It's very badly governed, if anything. People can't agree on make, doing things, even when the danger is very clear and all that. I mean, that is the system that we have created, right? And so, in some sense, you know, it is in this context we are trying to, to, to move forward. So, that, I mean, keep that in mind. Now, <clears throat> uh, three things you mentioned. One is that, you know, um, until 1992, there was no participation of non-government organizations in any intergovernmental process. Okay? 1992, and particularly the sustainable development, opened that door. And that has been consistent. 
every single meeting of the United Nations, the General Assembly, not the Security Council, which is oftentimes very close meeting, and there are some close meetings, but every single meeting has NGOs allowed in as observers. And in many cases, they can participate, they can, they can, they can engage with this thing. Youth groups have a specific chair. You know, they are invited. Now, clearly you can say that there should be more, but you cannot say that no attempt has been made thus far to bring this in. Um, business groups, yes, indeed, it is true that until 1992, business groups were kept out. But pre increasingly, people felt that business groups were influencing the governments, etc. So they also have a, a place at the table, except that they prefer to work behind closed doors and, and, and through their governments. Now, this is, this is kind of a situation. Um, there is a kind of an attempt to marry two different concerns. Okay? There is a real politics concerns. If Michael has the power and I want to get things done, I will try to go along with it. Okay? If I try to get something done over here, it's not that I will come and give you a speech and say, you know, change everything over here. I will try to walk, talk to people who have the power and the influence and so forth. There is a way in which power is distributed around the world, and it is an attempt to do this. But at the same time, there is also an attempt to marry it with a certain degree of idealism and a certain degree of vision, and that happens to take place through a process which can only be called a combination of transparency and voice. You know, that is not something which always and immediately translates into action, but it is a way of keeping a check on the way in which this power is kind of handled behind, behind closed doors. Now, admittedly, if I were kind of uh, uh, a philosopher king and wanted to set up a perfect system, I would have done something differently. But if I were to operate in the real world, this is probably the best that I would try to do. I'm going to leave it there, but maybe Michael will invite me again and we can have a long conversation. About it. Uh, Christian and Greg, would you like to respond to that question? I mean, I think one problem of the international system, if we're talking about, you know, international law and uh, the UN, which it, uh, you were talking about, but you also have the, you have the international financial institutions that were created at the Bretton Woods Conference after 1945, and those are structurally, fundamentally undemocratic. They're controlled by the United States, and they're used as tools of U.S. economic policy. For a while, that was a kind of defensive development, def defensive developmentalism against socialism, you know, proving that capitalism could deliver the goods, often with high environmental price, damming rivers, uh, you know, but electrifying cities in the process, et cetera, et cetera. There's a shift in thinking due to the profit crisis of the 1970s away from Keynesianism, away from developmentalism to embrace the ideas of Hayek and Friedman. Friedman gets all the press, but it's really Hayek who uh, lays out these ideas, these neoclassical economic ideas in the 30s, bemoaning the rising collectivism, meaning everything from Soviet socialism over to the New Deal, and at the same time, explicitly arguing for a generation-long strategy to retake the intellectual high ground and then retake the institutions that call the shots. And out of that comes the right-wing think tank movement and et cetera, et cetera. So the moment then is right for a rethink of international economic policy in the 70s because profit margins had pretty much collapsed in the core economic economies and that can be summed up as the rebuilding process from World War II was done, so that big boom was over, and you get a shift in thinking. And since then, there's this other aspect of the international state system, which is about hammering the global south economically. And um, I mean, if you bring that into a discussion of the international state system, and then layer climate change on top of it, and it's like, you know, we have to acknowledge the, the way the game is fundamentally rigged. I mean. The, you know, the, the most powerful states in the UN sit on the Security Council, but then economically, you know, there's, there's this other structure of power. The UN, the US controls the most votes in the IMF World Bank, always appoints the World Bank president, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of economic power has to be brought into the kind of question you're asking or you're not dealing with all of the components in the problem. Okay, okay and I agree with him, so. Next question. Thank you, you guys. Come on. Uh, Eric, while you guys are cogitating on your questions, you know, I think uh, 
uh, Gregory makes good points. I'm sorry I called you Jeffrey, and I think I did, and, and, and forgot and forgot Tariq's name. But, but I think that this is what I think, just real quick. It happens so often. There's something that phonetically goes on where people hear Greg, and then I've, so, so often people they, come they up They call me saying, Richard for some reason. What's your name again? Jeff? It just happens. Okay. So I wasn't at all. But I think that, um, I think, you know, there's, there's a, there's an implication in what you said that there's a, um, first of all, I'm not sure that the, I mean, that the environmental left should be blamed for the securitization discourse. Uh, okay, you're not blaming. But as I see it, you know, there's a kind of no-win situation, which is that the, uh, I mean, one, I mean, th there, these are, as you rightly said, you know, climate change is, a problem of human freedom and you know well-being and it is hammering people and we know that it's going to do that much more intensely I mean the best science says the sea will rise by three feet I mean what will happen to Lagos Nigeria when that happens where will those people go well the Pentagon has a story they're planning for it and I think that you know there is a risk if we do what I've done in this book and say, okay, yeah, there's a, there's a security component to this. There is a risk that that can play into the hands of the right. But there's also uh, a risk of ignoring it and not addressing the problem. And an analogy, to my mind, seems to be the way crime was addressed or not addressed by the left to some extent in the UK and the US in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was sort of dismissed and it became a right-wing issue. And the left had no real explanation about crime. And the fact of the matter is that there was a big crime spike that had a, mostly had a lot to do, there was economic causes, but a lot of it had to do with the big youth bulge in the society. Any, any society where there's lots of young people, you're going to have more crime. I mean, a, a group of stock market, a, a group of stockbrokers with more young stockbrokers is going to commit more crime than older stockbrokers. I mean, there's a tendency for young people to take risks. But there was a real crime spike, and people, working people, Poor people suffered from it. And the, the left's inability to really do anything about that and say anything credible about it was part of how the working class was pulled over to Thatcher, elements of the working class were pulled over to Thatcher and pulled over to Reagan. Um, again, that's not to say that you know, it could have worked if there was a better story offered by the left. Because there were people saying, you know, hey, wait a minute, there are root causes, you know, that, you know and there were you know, maligned and dismissed and mostly just ignored. But I feel like we have a problem, which is that we cannot just sidestep the issues that the right calls issues, because some of them actually are issues. And we need to, like, find a way, and I'm not sure I've done it sufficiently, to credibly explain what's going on and fundamentally, you know, get back to root causes and, and make a, a deeper critique that gets at um, what needs to be done to prevent this stuff. And I mean, I think one way to think about it is like preventative versus reactive. I mean, there's almost nothing that can be done. When people say, well, what, do you, well, what, what should we do about this, that? It's like, well, you, at that point, you're on the Pentagon's terrain. Like, what do we do about this crisis? It's like, I don't know about that crisis, but the one that we don't even know about that's coming down the pike in 10 or 20 years, what we can do about it is not reduce every government in the global south to a ramshackle, uh, inept little shell to be pushed around because those states will not have the capacity to do anything progressive. And when politics in a developing country starts to turn violent, uh, it, it you know really has negative effects on any possibility for civilian progressive political movements to develop. So I think. That's just a comment I, I throw out there. I, I, I take your point, and I think what you know what, what you're doing is 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 the, is the right approach, is the is the appropriate approach, and that is you know to offer a radical, you know literally radical, small r radical kind of analysis of how this has come about. You know by focusing on the flow of arms, neoliberalism, and climate change. What kind of convergence? The catastrophic. Convergence. Catastrophic convergence. Yeah. So you know the convergence. I like that. I mean that's a, that's an appealing diagnosis, analysis of it. Um, and, but that's not, but that's what, what, what you are doing is not what's in the discourses coming out of Washington and Brussels and, and, and northern capitals. And I think but I, would, but I, would, I would make a critique of my own work that, that it, it would be wrong to say that one 
you know, someone could read this book and be like, yep, yeah, oh, and those lefties, they've got a good critique about capitalism works, but hey, there's no such thing as social change. We're never reforming this, so I guess we really just do have to go with the right. Exactly, you know? and I think that's the, the concern is that, you know, the, you know this, 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 this long tradition, and I know you know it, of scapegoating the global south, of sort of treating the global south as a lurking zone of, you know, a lurking threat, a zone of insecurity, um, a, you know, a tropic of violence, you know, between the tropics. That's, that's the, you know, and Jeffrey Sachs' sort of, you know, geography of poverty kind of, you know, analysis, where when you take maps and you overlay it on indicators, it's that band between the two tropics that is the concerning band and all kinds of uh, indicators. And so that's part of that sort of view of the South as a threat. And then therefore what we must do, you know, we being, well, often, you know, many discourses, it's Americans, but the, the North, what we must do is prepare for it. Prepare for the onslaught, and that's what I, I think we I think what we have to do is push back against it, yeah. and and, and call and call it you know for what it is, and build solidarity with movements in the global south. And I think fundamentally, if you know, one of the key intellectual maneuvers that has to happen is like historicizing problems. You know, yeah. if you're not if you don't historicize a problem, it's like you've almost lost the argument. You know, uh, if if you're forced to argue in the realm of what do we do about this emergency now. You know, we're asking you who have no resources, nothing, no organization, we, the establishment, the state with our armies and, and all of our resources, you know, what do you suggest about this emergency? Really, you can't do anything, you can't say anything. But you can provide for people at large tools for understanding stuff that can hopefully affect policy now to prevent, a, you know, a collapse and disintegration. Because I think that is also I mean, that's not unrealistic at all. And that is, that's not a new critique of capitalism, you know? I mean, the system is prone to undermining its own base and collapsing economically, politically, and now we're confronting possibly environmentally, or very likely. I mean, one thing I said this morning, too, um, is that when Rush Limbaugh and the Heartland Institute and James Inhofe come around to admitting, to acknowledging that climate change is happening, even though they might not say it's anthropogenic, when they do so, they'll embrace the notion of it as being a security issue, as a security threat. And again, that's what I want to, I think we have to sort of puncture that. The other thing they do is they, they present it as gradualist. And that's the one reason why, you know, I think it's credible and, and useful to make the case that, you know, there are sudden shifts and big problems. Because, you know, as Rex Tillerson, head of Exxon, said when he was questioned a couple months ago about this, he said, ah, we'll just adapt, we'll just move our, you know, in, um, agricultural zone slowly north, and it's like, that's not sufficient. Well, uh, if, if I may um, interject here, although <laughs> I think Michael and I just feel they should just let the two of you fight it out. Um, <laughs> yeah, take it outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the, the concern, I mean, uh, let me put it in a, in a kind of a crude way. Um, if, if there are, let's say, hardline, right wing, or without mincing word, fascist groups, um, they're not blind either. They, they know. So this idea that you know maybe just because some people introduce this notion of security threat is something which has put the steel in the spine of, uh, of, of hardline or fascist groups, I, I think that's a little bit too um, simplistic, if I, if I may say. If I, may say. I, I do see that there is now an emergence of uh, across the world, an emergence of right-wing ideals which have suddenly become far more acceptable than they had been, let's say, 50 years ago. Um, that is true in Europe. People thought that they had defeated these ideas. It's back. It's true in the United States. You can see a number of uh, instruments which have now become, a number of things which have now become uh, you know, quite a credible threat even to a kind of a uh, a, a social contract or basic, uh, you know, the uh, sort of a common understanding of what the United States is about. And definitely it is true in, in many parts of the world. Uh, in the parts of the world that I come from, it oftentimes has been mobilized by the religious fundamentalist groups, but that's not necessary. In a number of other places, places there it's being done elsewhere. And they are actually focused on this. Now, I don't see that they have actually read the environmental security literature, but I do see that they understand that something is coming down the line to which the answer is to arm yourself and begin to not only to defend yourself, but also to attack other people. I, I do see this, these kind of things happening. 
I read the environmental security literature or the climate security literature in a very different way. I mean, it is much more that, look, if these threats are coming, then it is not something that we, sh we should leave either to the military or to these very hardline, right-wing, xenophobic, in introverted groups to take on board and run with them while we turn a blind eye and say, no, no, we are going to be very goody people and we are just going to solve the climate problem. We should not ignore it. Having said that, I do think that we do need to be more precise and careful in terms of how we do our analysis. So in other words, if some trends are not happening, we should say it. If they're happening, we should say it. But nevertheless, it is not an issue that we should leave to somebody else. So I mean, I, which is, I mean, this part of the discussion that we had earlier this morning, I mean, it is that, you know, these are things people do know. And, and I, I think part of our problem is, I mean, I have sometimes, oftentimes when I speak in northern audiences, I have to tell them that, look, people in developing countries are not stupid. They know what's going on. In the same way, I can say that, you know, if there are right-wing groups or fascist groups or, you know, you know both mili militaristic groups, they're not stupid. They know what's going on. They are, if they are pro projecting certain ways of thinking and certain ways of acting, one should sort of take it. But we should also try to understand what kind of threats are emerging and how do we begin to engage with them and how do we make sure that they do not fall, fall into a trap in which the only solution is a military solution. That, that's my, my, my concern. I want to just add very briefly before we turn to the next question that I wanted, I, I want to affirm something Christian said and he said it rather quickly and, and uh, w without so much emphasis, I, I think it might have been not heard by everyone. But uh, the problem of weak states is a problem for many reasons, but it's also a problem in relationship to the problems of climate change. So we need strong states. And many people in the United States, when they hear talk like that, worry because they think a strong state equals an aggressive military. But actually, weak states turn to, and especially weak societies, turn to military solutions for everything. And uh, when, strong, when states are strong in the proper ways, they don't have to turn to securitization in respect to every other problem. So I, I just wanted to add that. And uh, with that, who's got the next question? Here you go. Thank you. OK, so I mean, I think it's, it's become obvious that climate change is something that's indisputable. But it seems like the question at hand is the human contribution to climate change. And so it seems like um, the idea is that because of our contribution to CO2 levels, we're having an ad adverse effect on climate change. And so my question is, if carbon dioxide only makes up 0.04% of the atmosphere, how does a spike in CO2 lead to an adverse effect um, on climate change? It does so by blocking the exit of heat back out into space. And the number that you should pay attention to is that the atmospheric concentration of CO2 has gone from 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution to over 400 parts per million. So that's the key ratio that this is all about. From 0 0.0285 to more than 0 0.04. And I mean, you know, it's always a matter of scale. Like I can say, you know, uh, this person is six feet tall, but you know, this person is seven feet tall, but that's nothing because I've seen a building that's 100 feet tall. Well, I mean, you know, we can't compare it. You know, so carbon dioxide, even in small concentrations, has the ability to block the exit of infra infrared radiation, and that actually does heat up uh, this thing. Now, the real problem is that regardless of whether you believe the anthropogenic or, or not, if the concentration of carbon dioxide is something that we have to do something about, regardless of how it has been caused, then we have to think of ways to do it, and ways to do it which would enable greater cooperation among people rather than basically pit us against each other. And, and, and in some sense, that's the challenge that we have been trying to, to figure out. And part of you know, I mean, the subtext of your question is the talking points of climate denialism. You know, and uh, you know, you should really anyone who pays heed to that stuff, you should, you know, 
we look closely at what constitutes a, basically a scientific consensus. You know, international and national scientific bodies using peer-reviewed journals. It, if you look at real scientific literature and real scientific studies, there's no debate. I said this earlier. But you can find debate. You know, you can find it on Fox News. You can find it in the editorial pages. But that's not scientific debate. That's political debate. Scientific debate goes on between scientists in peer-reviewed, blindly peer-reviewed journals. Let's see if I can speak a little better than last time. Uh, first of all, I wanted to um, comment that uh, your view of the whole seeing these uh, the southern region as, as you know an imminent threat. Uh, it's basically um, I do believe that is a simplistic kind of way of looking at it. It's Basically, I think that what they see as a threat is uh, if you have these people as having strong states, that means they would have to have access to their own resources and there are certain positions of power who would like to not see that happen. They would like to control most of the resources. And that's what we have going on as far as I can tell. Also, another thing that I see happening as a result of global climate change is this, um, you, Dr. Minch mentioned the effect on animals as well as humans, and something that I have not heard a lot of discussion about, but I have seen, is um, fungal infections are becoming widespread and very difficult to cure. I'm seeing it in people, I'm seeing it in animals, they have the bats with the fungus on their faces, and there's also things like cancer and other things that are exacerbated by the global warming, but not so much a direct effect like the fungal issues. Unfortunately, I, you see a lot of denial in a lot of the medical field. You have doctors decrying this new wave of what people are calling candida. And I'm seeing a lot of this happen in my field of work. And people are still going on about how this is not happening. And when you have this issue of having little access to resources in this current debate on who has access to health care and who, des who deserves health care more than others, I see this eminent crisis and this access to resource becoming a problem. I'd like to know a little bit more about your opinions on this. I have no, I, I don't know how to respond to that. I have no medical expertise, so. Um, <coughs> uh, let me say two things, uh, sorry. Let me say two, two quick things here. I, first of all, I think, thank you very much for reminding us about the health effects. And uh, uh, this is certainly a matter of uh, considerable uh, scientific investigation. Um, as a member of the IPCC, we know that we have special uh, uh, chapters on different types of health imp impacts. You know, so it's, it's, it's really something at least the scientific community is, is engaged with. Um, and as in all of these matters, as you know, sort of, you know, it's, it's very, the progress of understanding, even connecting the dots, is, is, is incremental and slow. You know, so initially when we have information it's very uncertain and, and you know, the confidence intervals are very broad and then gradually it begins to come closer and closer together and I think that's the direction which we are saying, uh, which we are moving. Um, and um, um, at this point, I mean, that's basically, I do want to appreciate the fact that you brought it in and many of us missed it. But I want to make a comment on the other point that you made in response to um, uh, Christians. Now, the thing is, look, uh, as far as states and even governments uh, are concerned, one can be as critical as, as we want. Um, and it really behooves us to be critical. Uh, I mean, it, in some of my writings, I've even referred to uh, this thing that all governments are by nature criminal activities. You know, I mean, if they were, if the things that are done by governments are done in civil society, they would be criminal. We, we understand that. We know how these things, these things happen. We know the relationship between corporates and uh, the, the corporate or profit motives and political motives. We know how these, 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 these processes are, uh, are, are taking place. And so, you know, really I don't feel that that is, you know, in some sense that is rather obvious and one needs to, to, to represent it. Nevertheless, given this, we do find certain changes taking place at certain times. It is not because all of a sudden people were angels and they became devils. They've always been devils. You know, or perhaps a combination of angels and devils. But some things happen which, 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 which trigger it. And Christian is very right that there are things that happened in the 19th, uh, after the 1970s, which brought about a change in which the public sector in developing countries was systematically dismantled with the exception of countries 
which could afford to thumb their nose at the external pressures, which happened largely to be large countries, or countries which, which, I mean, which, happened, which could be China, it could be India, it could be Brazil, but certainly uh, the bulk of the smaller countries and, and countries which were relatively more vulnerable, which were dependent on foreign trade or foreign aid as, uh, for, their, for their survival, were all decimated. The public sector was decimated. Now, it is also the case that it, this kind of thing happened in the rich countries as well, although they had, they had much more capacity to, to uh, uh, benefit from, even from that, from that decimation. Now, one interpretation, and I quite, quite agree with, with Christian on this, is one interpretation is that if you look at the, the, um, the data, by the 1970s, the uh, ratio of corporate profits had been coming down consistently since roughly about mid-1950s. About 1954, it had been coming down consistently. And so the Keynesian solution of actually reviving the economy again and again was able to stabilize it, but it was stabilizing it at the cost of a consistent depreciation of the profit rate. Now, if you think of a, a, a national balance between wages, profits, taxes, and um, rental income, and you want to restore profits, what do you do? You either have to squeeze wages or you have to squeeze taxes. Okay? And that's both of those things you did. So we created domestic inequality. We created international inequality to address this problem. Now, I, I personally tend to agree with this thing. There is a big body of opinion which, which subscribes to this. In other words, I, I would suggest to you that the decimation of the public sector, both in developing countries and in developed countries, did not take place because all of a sudden the states became de uh, devilish when they were angelic in the first place, but because something happened to which they were able to find a solution which the rest of the world, we citizens, closed our eyes and said, okay, we'll tolerate it. And that's how, in some sense, the right wing emerged, decimated the state, squeezed the wage rate. I mean, you look at the United States. Uh, 1945 to 1975, you have a roughly a doubling of the economy, doubling of productivity, doubling of the wage rate. 1975 to 2005, doubling of the economy, doubling of the um, productivity, and the wage rate is flat because everything is now going back into profits. Now, this kind of a new social contract emerged because we were not able to take, take we were not able to address the problem differently. Now. Maybe where we disagree, Christian and I, is that I think that it was because the energy bonanza had come to an end. And so this way of perpetual growth in which wages could continue to rise, productivity could rise, and corporate profits could rise, could not be maintained. And so I think the end of the energy bonanza gave us a new economic order in which the only way to maintain profits was to squeeze wages. And that's exactly what we did. Our problem is that now we have the second shock 30 years later, and we have no cushion left. The states have been destroyed in developing countries. Inequality is at the highest point in the United States in rich countries. There's no other place to go. And right now, this is where the paralysis comes from. The right wing doesn't know what else to do because they've done everything that they've done. The left wing doesn't want to be able to say, go back to a Keynesian world because they cannot address the climate and energy problem in the same way. So we need to find a new basis for a social contract. Okay, I mean, that's, that's my What is that? Yeah, what is that? No, I mean, what I, what I, my, my view in this thing is that the only basis for a social, I mean, look, if, if we were in a situation where we could sort of craft a new social contract on the basis of a new economy, I would be the first person to yeah. say it. I do think that it is within our power, but I don't think it is within our power in our generation or even in my children's generation. So my sense in, in, in all of this is that we need to find a basis for economic prosperity and growth, which buys the time for uh, my grandchildren to be able to solve the problem. I do think that eventually we will have to learn to live with each other in a finite world. Mm -hmm. If we have to do it today, the only way we'll do it will start killing each other. So we need today to find a way in which we can sort of have something to hand over to our children, not a, a world of barbarism again. So that, that's my, my approach to a new social contract. But, but this economic basis, I think, is, this is absolutely fundamental. This is really a way of understanding how the, the economic st structure has been changed. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm, I'm glad I have another fan of the profit crisis as the key to history, because I really think it, it, it is very important to understanding where we are now, it, precisely as uh, our colleague just laid out. I mean, I think you're right also about the energy bonanza being part of it, but overproduction is a really big part of why there was an economic crisis in the 70s. And, you know, there was the World War II killed millions of people, but it also destroyed billions of dollars worth of assets that had to be rebuilt, all those European and Japanese cities, all that productive output. And that process of rebuilding was part of the basis of the long boom. And you see in the statistics by the mid-60s when profit rates, at least in the US, it's, that's really when they start to, to, to dip down to 73 where they kind of bail, uh, bottom out, that there's saturation in markets globally. So, you know, there's, uh, the world has the capacity produ to produce more cars that can be purchased. It can produce more sneakers than can be purchased. Of course, there are many people who need shoes, they need medicine, they need education, but they don't have the money to get it, so therefore they don't constitute economic demand. Um, and that, to some extent, one way forward th where there could be a revival of growth growth among many environmentalists and leftists has a bad name, but if it could be done within ecological boundaries, one way that there could be a kind of long boom in prosperity would be to deal with climate change, to just wipe out the fossil fuel industry. I mean, what would, what would stimulate investment and put people to work uh, and under a capitalist system with proper regulation, et cetera, et cetera, produce not only wages and, and, but profits as well? I mean, what could be better than just basically euthanizing the fossil fuel industry and trying to replace that? Okay, it's politically almost impossible to imagine how, how to do that. But you think about economically. If you just like Exxon, well, just write off the value. Worthless, it's scrap metal now. You know, and there's a suddenly a huge need that, that has to be filled with investment and work and productivity. So I think there's a potential that actually in dealing with the climate change, with, with climate change there could be the basis for some growth with, with equity. Um. <laughs> you, yeah, you, said, you said politically impossible. No, 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 it's not only politically. Yeah. Look, think about it like this. You can see. What is, what is the, what is the uh, are there any economists in this room? What is the GNP of the world today? That's, you know, maybe about 70, 70 trillion dollars. I mean, you know, uh, roughly about, yeah, a bit under $10,000 per capita, about 70 trillion dollars roughly. Um, what, is, what do you think is the value of capital stock? You know, output capital ratio, people say maybe one is to two, one is to three. You're talking about $200 trillion, all the capital stock in the world. What is the value of oil underground? If it's one trillion barrels, which is the most conservative estimate, at $100 a barrel, that's $100 trillion. You have to give up all your roads, houses, factories, all the infrastructure in the world, all the capital in the world, to pretty much to buy up the oil that is sitting on the ground. I, I mean, you see, part of the problem with oil and with these resources is that they're just too expensive. If it was like ozone, we would have bought it off. I mean, ozone, we were able to solve the problem because literally we bought off the chemical companies. It was too small. It was small price. This one, we would actually have to basically mortgage the entire planet to be able to buy off those things. You, we, it is, I mean, you know, conceptually, this is exactly what is going to happen. People will have to stop using fossil fuels. We know that. But buying it out is not an option because we don't have the money. But we do have different options. I mean, I have proposed to you one way of addressing this as, as, as an alternative, you know, to think about, uh, and here Christian and I are on the same page. Think about a re renewable energy boom that would, over a period of time, give rise to a different trajectory. It would not give rise to expropriation of the uh, people who have assets sitting underground. In fact, it would actually end up protecting the their, 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 their value of their resources, but it would reduce the amount of output that comes from it. And uh, I don't want to go into more details, but really the, the, the question is that we need to think in a in economic terms in terms of how we solve the problem, but we also need to think in political terms of how do we, how do we get it. Mark, yeah. Hello. Uh, my
my question is this: It seems like in order, it seems like in order to address this problem, there needs to be more more dialogue with developing nations. So my question is: How can you increase dialogue with developing nations in an international spectrum when it seems like the only way to get a voice is through having a lot of money or through having a lot of weapons, which of course developing nations don't really have much of. Well, as I said earlier, you know, as I said. Uh, during my presentation to, of course, rely on the goodwill of persons or powerful elites that run states would be silly. So uh, I think increasingly uh, poor majority countries, and you know, they're run by elites also. So I mean poor majority peoples in different kinds of coalitions of power have to find ways to force uh, elites in their own countries and in countries like ours in the North Atlantic uh, to uh, be more fair and uh, transparent and uh, uh, democratic. And you need uh, global democratic institutions that need to develop and uh, they might develop inside the United Nations. They, they might develop outside of the United Nations. Um, but it's a, it's a, you know, I agree with Terry, I mean, we probably all do. None of this is gonna happen quickly, and, uh, but we have to start doing it all right now. And uh, we have to have uh, sooner rather than later, but by sooner I mean two or three generations down the road, um, really global democratic institutions where people as such on planet Earth have power distributed to them on the basis of their personhood and that we have global institutions that collect and direct that kind of democratic power because elites who are invested in uh, the problems that we're describing today are not somehow through some epiphany going to change their ways. And uh, so uh, this is about global democracy it's about social change. It's about mechanisms for bringing that about. And you know, that, there, there are a lot of details there, but that's just the, that's the, that's the basic question for me, uh, the basic answer to your question for me. If I could concur with that, I mean, put it in different languages, what you're talking about is social movements, right? Which we haven't really touched on enough, perhaps. I mean, Social change happens through social movements. What makes social movements? Part of what makes it is ideas, right? You have to have an analysis of the problem. You have to have some credible place you're going. Also institutions, uh, parties, uh, NGOs perhaps. I mean, you could, we could have a whole discussion about what role NGOs really play in terms of social change. But I'm a kind of old fashioned that way in that I think that ideas and institutions as building blocks of social movements are very important. And an interesting place to look at this, I was talking with somebody in the audience about this, is Latin America, where there is a pushback against the inevitable, like here we are, we're just stuck in this neoliberal nightmare where you know the state is nothing but the police force and all its social democratic features have been stripped away. And grassroots social movements that frequently didn't get along with each other and you know don't like their leaders they've elected, mobilize, take state power through elections, you know, and are moving towards, you know, they, they frequently, I'm talking about like Bolivia, Ecuador, talk in terms of socialism, but that's not really what's going on, on economically. It's like kind of developmentalist redistributive project of managing capitalism in a more humane way. But what produced that was strong social movements that were guided by kind of internal coherence and uh, frequently very traditional forms of solidarity, clear ideas, and willing to uh, have a, you know, having an analysis about the role of business, capital, and how the state is used by it, but also autonomous of it to some extent, and can be forced to do things for the majority of people. So I think one of the key ideas that social movements need to address if they're to be effective is the autonomy, the relative autonomy of the state. Yes, the state bails out the banks. Yes, the state does the bidding of big business, 
but the state also puts checks on business, prevents them from employing children, polluting here, polluting there. You know, we have to recognize the way in which the state within capitalist society contains the economy to prevent total barbarism, and that that capacity of the state can, in fact, be rebuilt by social movements, and it's happening in Latin America. And I think that's a great region to study, to think about how do we create social change. It's not going to be the exact same way they did it, but there are some very important lessons there. I was just going to say, too, I mean, the thought that ran through my mind is the idea of the, uh, is the, uh, I, I just recently started to watch this television series that everybody's been watching for a bunch of years, you know, Mad Men. You know, it's been out for the longest time, and I, I didn't, didn't watch any of it. But I started watching it, it, it makes me think about big tobacco. You know, here are these ad men trying to deal with tobacco in, you know, in 60, 61, 62. You know, they, they, they knew that it was bad. The Surgeon General hadn't come out yet with its report that it's bad, you know, that it's as bad as, it, as, as we know it to be now. And it's just this idea that, you know, how do you get people to change their way of thinking with respect to something like tobacco? I mean, Tarek mentioned ozone and the Montreal Protocol. So I'm not saying that, and I know that ozone is different than, than, than carbon, and I know that tobacco, big, big tobacco is different than big oil. But is it not possible for social movements, both in the North and in the South, to begin to criticize, deride, shame, you know, uh, d d shame uh, big oil for, for what it is. And I think part of the new movement that's happening in many universities and colleges with the divestment is, is a step in that direction where, you know, students are pressing and boards of trustees, are pr not boards of trustees, but students are pressing universities and other institutions to divest of oil. And I think with the XL pipeline fight and that kind of fight, that's the glimmer. You know, I'm not saying that, I'm not, I'm not, Candide about it. I'm not saying that you know it's all going to be fine, but I think that that's the uh, the potential for some change here. I mean, uh, if I if I can just quickly add to this, I, um, don't take me as an essay <laughs> entirely. I, you know, I, I I actually appreciate a lot. There are lots of little things that are happening, and we don't know. It's like the flapping of the wings of a butterfly. We don't know which one is going to produce a storm, but we are very happy that all of this uh, this this fluttering is going to take place. Um, but let let me say uh, two things, and then uh, well, one sort of background, and then just one um, uh, uh, sort of outcome of that. One is that you know one of the greatest inventions of the last 200 years, I mean, even though we've looked at technology and industry and so forth, uh, is democracy. I mean, democracy, political parties, um, even, you know, the rights, I mean, th even this notion of citizenship, you know, the citizenship, the right to have rights. This, this, is, this is something completely new. In one way, one can say that we now have an economic system which has a natural gravitational trend towards concentration. And the more concentration of wealth takes place, the more it is, requires the concentration of political power to protect that wealth. So people who have that wealth will use everything in their power, okay, whether it's the communicative resources, physical resources, etc., to protect that wealth. They will use their power to say science is wrong or this thing is wrong or that would be understanding. But we know that there has been all along a political process whose purpose is to distribute that power. And if you think of the democratic institutions, its purpose is to distribute that power, you know, by, through media, through uh, voting, through rights, and so forth. Now, the challenge now is that this has now become a global agenda. And in the global agenda, the concentration of wealth has now proceeded apace. The last 40 years have been world champions in this regard. But the distribution of power, the political prowess, process has lagged behind. And I think what the gentleman was asking was, what kind of a political process can now emerge so that our values as human beings, as, as whatever we need collectively, are the ones that reign over sort of individual motives or individual interests and so forth. And so the idea of social movements, I personally, is the one that I use is this idea of the global citizens movement. You know, we have com countries talking to each other. And businesses, they talk to each other when they want to fix prices. They will do it, forget it. I mean, you, you and I don't have to do anything about it. But citizens talking to each other. A global citizens movement is what we really need today. 
both as a way of articulating what our values are and as a way of holding, holding people in check. And all of the other things that we are talking about, whether it's NGOs, whether it's the small successes, are all a grist for that mill. This is something that is going to, to uh, initiate that process. So as you people are thinking about it, this is one of the things which we hope that your generation will be able to achieve. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Z? All right, I'm going to try to stumble through this because you guys actually said quite a bit that is going to be the, the basis for it, but this question, and I'm going to link together some statements that each of you had made. Um, specifically, I particularly like the statement uh, earlier uh, that developing countries aren't idiots. Um, but that seems to be the common perception in a lot of you know, major northern states is that you see a lot of these, you know, like the, the tropic zones as they're just a bunch of idiots and they will respond to everything. Um, and also a comment made about the DOD, the Department of Defense, right? What is their contingency plan for a, a future um, environmental disaster? Uh, that's easily answered with its plan C. Um, they're always cookie cutter. They're always, um, <clears throat> they always use previous plans in the past much like a baseball player, you know, wearing the same socks, you know, tried and true methods type of thing. So there really isn't a plan. It's just a plan that they used before on some other issue. Um, so the big question is, um, do you think one of the big problems that we're facing is not necessarily uh, the, um, the, the problems themselves, it's the mindset that we have is that that's how we view things. That's how we come up with our solutions and that's why they're always inadequate is because we have an outdated view of the world that, you know, uh, you have, you know, to get peace, you have to prepare for war is not necessarily a case in war more it was 500 years ago. So I want to get your comments on, on what you, what you think is, uh, okay. um, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I, I the, the one, the one thing that, um, jumped into my mind was your use of the word mindset. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I think social movements is, you know, has a sense of there's kind of a collective um, consciousness, if you will, uh, that, that, that can be, that can be uh, appealing and effective. Mindset, I think, I don't know, I, I worry sometimes about the individualization of a lot of this discourse. Um, some years ago, I, I heard a panel where, you know, they, they, it began with, uh, it was an environmental panel, and the uh, the moderator said, "I thought what we'd do is we'd begin with people talking about what they've done, you know, recently. That's a transgression against the environment." And one person said, "You know, I flew here to this conference. You know, the conference was was in San Francisco." Another person said, "I ate a cheeseburger." You know, a third person said, "I bought toys from China for my child." And you know, with each comment, everyone said, "Oh." And it finally came around to Michael Maniades, who's at Allegheny College and, and writes a lot about these kinds of things. And he said, "I hate this kind of question." Because it comes down to this individualization of responsibility where we talk about the mindset and that sort of how we approach these things. I'm not saying that you're asking that with your question because you're talking more about sort of policymakers, but I think when we think about mindset, it's important to sort of kick it up away from individual actions, you know, whether we drive a Prius or you know, whether we eat meat or whatever it might be, and hold policymakers responsibility, whether, responsible, whether it be you know, state level or military or corporate. Uh, policy that that is that is derived. Um, so again, so again, maybe I'm not being fair to your question. Uh, it, it, maybe I'm not uh, responding properly to it. But again, just the mindset to me sounds too psychological and too individualistic. Um, it, it has that potential. Is that fair? Well, I was. <laughs> yeah, I was looking for. Uh... I was trying to run through words, you know, something that would, would make sense of what I was trying to get across. And yeah, I am talking about the policymakers, okay. that they always, that all of the policies seem to have this underlying uh, philosophy behind them, right? Is that it's, the, the philosophy itself is not changing, only the words on how they're responding to individual situations end up having those words change, but they're still responding to the, the, the same sort of uh, patterns. patterns or uh, superstitious even. Zach, you, you were making the claim that um, 
the way we think, the patterns we've rested upon and utilized, the conventions we have, uh, our standard operating procedures, et cetera, both in terms of policy and in intellectually, and are, are need to be changed if we're ever going to change this problem. Uh, and and that's right. And you also indicated that there's you know we're always we're always behind in that respect. We're always trying to use old discourse and old conceptions and old symbols and old language to fix new problems. And that's a, that is itself a problem. And you're right about that. But I want to say this. H however, there's a very complex problematic for us because if you're too far out, if you're too visionary, if you're too brilliant, if you know things other people don't know and you can see way out there but nobody else can and you know new words and you know new discourses and you know new conceptions and you write cool books and you're, you know, and people can't be with you in it. They don't understand. They're not where you are. They can't be where you are. They're not ready for that. That's too abstract for them. It's not going to help. And you're right that we can't just use the same words. We can't just use the same tropes. We can't just say the same things. We can't just be held to the same conceptions. We can't, you know, we can't be, in a word, conservative. We can't just be about conserving what we have and hope for change. The only way you get change is, in fact, to change. And we need new tools and new conceptions and new discourses and new institutions, et cetera, to make that change. But the complexity of it is you need to build bridges. You need to talk to a lot of people. You need to mobilize a lot of people. You need to get a lot of people on board. You need a lot of buy-in and investment. And you can't do that. Like a bunch of philosophers in a room might have an interesting conversation among themselves. A group of scientists in a room might have an interesting conversation among themselves. But you know, we need everybody on board. And so it's a real challenge. You've, you've, put, you've asked a great question. Uh, because you've, you've put your, your thumb on what I think is a very, very important part of the whole problematic, which is how do we bridge from where we are to where we need to be in a way that we bring everybody along without simply relying on everything that's, that's not served us so well or, or at least isn't serving us so well at the moment. And, you know, so I also am now restating the problem without offering a solution. But I do think that it does go back at least to one thing we've been discussing, which is how democrat de democratic power functions. And it functions through certain kinds of deliberative processes and coalitions and, and uh, consonances and assemblages of people of different kinds and so on where we actually do listen to one another and then we can learn new w ways to speak, new ways to think, etc. Can I offer a few words in your support? Please. Uh, <laughs> I just got um, <laughs> um, The Great Depression, massive unemployment in all the develop developed countries. Uh, people who were supposed to know about this, to understand it, were the economists. And their recipe was, oh, it's, the wages are too high, market is not in equilibrium, government should back out. Uh, also, maybe we should save more, because that is the way the economic framework taught us. John Maynard Keynes writes, I mean, and he was really a man with a very twisted brain, shall we say, perhaps like yours. Uh, he writes a very small book, which anybody with a decent understanding of English can understand, in which he says, look, this is not the way to think about the world. This is the way the world works. And as it turns out, people were just waiting for that, and the moment it appears, it took off. Now, in some sense, I think the time is ripe for something like this. We do need that framework. And we do need both that simplicity, which can bring people around, and the complexity, which can capture everything that is necessary. We have done a lot of, there's a lot of literature, but there's no general theory of employment, income, and money. 
or in common, uh, in common interest. I mean, in other words, we haven't been able to frame it in a way in which we can, we can sort of pull this thing through. So in some sense, we can say the elements of what we need to do are there, but that thinking, which sort of brings it together and has enough compelling power, is not yet there. It is an agenda, let's say, up for the taking, and perhaps you will take it or perhaps somebody else. To, to, to concur and dissent a little on that, it's all, you know, I, first of all, I think that the, the, the direction this conversation has gone in today is very refreshing because I feel like we've gone down to like core issues and we're not just dealing with like this specific iteration of a problem or that specific iteration. So that gives me hope. But one, one thing about, in terms of the role of, what you're asking about essentially is the role of ideas in politics. And yes, ideas can move people, but there's also a way in which institutions move before they know what they're doing. And in relationship to Keynes and the New Deal, the first time he met Roosevelt, Roosevelt said to, I forget who it was, Hopkins or one of his guys after, he, after Keynes came in, he said, boy, that, that John Maynard Keynes, he must be some sort of a mathematician, not a political economist. He gave me a whole rigmarole of numbers. And like Roosevelt didn't understand Keynesianism, and he was at first trying to stimulate the economy and balance the budget. And Keynes was saying, "Look, you're not, you're, this doesn't make any sense. Just think about it." And what Roosevelt was doing was responding to real events with institutions, and the actual the ideas caught up and then helped articulate. So I think it's important to really keep in mind that there's a there's a dialectic, there's a balance that ideas don't lead, they, they exist in relationship to institutions, and that sometimes events and institutions lead, and that's where progressive voices can come in, is to explain what's already happening, explain you know, why things are the way they are, what needs to happen. And, and that requires watching structures and institutions, the economy and politics, closely and accurately. Okay, I wanna finish up with, by making an announcement and then saying one other thing. Uh, the announcement is I, I told the history department people I would do this for them, and I'm happy to do it, of course. But uh, shortly uh, after we wrap up here, there's a, a lecture by the uh, Ralph D. Mershon Distinguished Professor of History at Ohio State University. You know, the history department has a series of lectures called Turning Points in History, and he's going to be speaking about the turning point in the Vietnam War which is the Tet Offensive. And he's giving a lecture uh, in uh, the Student Center, room 206C. And if you're uh, for interested in, in more intellectual discussion yet today and tonight, I encourage you to go to that lecture. And so I've done, I've done the history department good. And now what I want to do is thank the three gentlemen who are up here with me at this table because they've given us a very wonderful day of, of wonderful thought and I very much appreciated this panel and thank you for being here.